Okay, hello. Welcome to my talk. Great that some people, even more people, actually made it up here. Even weather is great outside and just beer somewhere. Um, so we're talking about spec files and RPM. Uh, who am I? I'm working for Red Hat for quite a while now. I started in 2006. I, after about one year, I started getting involved in YAM, which is the updater, the predecessor of DNF. Basically, the, the, what the equivalent to, to Super. And after a year of optimizing it, I realized, well, I'm done here. If I want to do anything else, I need to go down one level. And so I get involved in RPM in around uh, 2008 and have stuck there for, for some reason. Um, that's actually my second visit to the OpenSUSE conf. I've been here before, but a lot of things have changed. I've, last time I've been here, it's been 2009, and it were very different times. And I've actually not really been in a conference. We've been hiding in some rooms and doing technical talk into how to merge the different patches that have been in, in, in OpenSUSE and in, in, in the Fedora tree at that point. So where are we in RPM-wise? We've done a few large changes and features, but it's been a while now. So it's like two, two and a half years till we, till we roll them out. File triggers and Boolean dependencies were one of the biggest, especially file triggers are, at least in Fedora, a big thing because they've basically uh, changed most of the scriptlets. So there's a huge amount of, uh, of packages that have been changed. I've actually not looked into uh, OpenSUSE, what's the state there of adoption, but maybe someone can uh, enlighten us on this. So we currently have a huge backlog of uh, mostly smaller features that we are going to release. The idea is to have an alpha release out next week, hopefully. Uh, but so over the next uh, uh, Fedora cycle, we want to get the release stabilized and then out. So traditionally, we've in RPM, use Fedora as our test bench. So basically, we release in an early in an early version of the next release, and then stabilize throughout that. Um, there. So and the, and the thing is, we've been pretty busy with this rel eight thing on the side. And so basically, after that's done, we're now thinking of what's the next big thing, what to do, where to go from here, and what to do, what what is the most important thing to to consider now. Um, and the problem with RPM development is always that the RPM developers are developers, and they are not really packagers. Yeah, we do have a few packages that we have to take care of, but that's not the basic side thing. This has led to, to basically the last decade that most changes, even if they are, have huge impact for packaging, like the file triggers are basically done from an RPM perspective and not from an RPM build perspective. So it's like, how do we want to have this installed on the system properly? And not so much what's the easiest for the packager to actually put it into something. Um, so that's basically what, something you want to do do next and to basically look into specs, files, and packaging from a packager perspective, see what can be improved and what can be made easier. Um, another thing that's more probably not that interesting for you, but uh, I had the data lying around, that's the growth of Fedora. I more or less assume that OpenSUSE, the data for OpenSUSE looks basically the same. The exact numbers are not that important. It starts here with 2004 and goes to basically now. And as you, as you can see, it's basically a linear growth in, in number of packages and also in the number of, uh, in the overall size of the distribution. That means the number of work that has to be done, each release gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger every time. And there's no sign of this slowing down or uh, stopping at any point. So the, 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 the only way around this is either to get more and more and more people involved, which is surely an option, but there's only so much you can do there. And the other option is to basically lower the amount of work needed for each update um, to be able to keep up with that. Um, 
That's basically all what I said about this. Um, so the question is, what can be removed from the package or what steps can be removed from, from actually doing updates or, or creating new packages? What can be automated and what can we remove from the manual work that's, that's uh, uh, needed? Um, so one big area has been scriptlets. That's kind of solved from an uh, implementation point of view with file triggers. I don't know how far this works in uh, OpenSUSE. Anyone an idea? Is this used? Are they used on a broader scale? I think only one use case. Okay. So that's, some, that's something worth looking into, basically replacing all the scriptlets in the in the uh, in most files in most packages and centralize them for those who don't know that's basically uh, the file triggers are basically you can run a script based on a file name that's in another package i don't it's possible as SUSE doesn't run that many scriptlets as we do but that's not what i heard ah there's an expert uh, <laughs> So the idea is basically to do all the scriptlets in a centralized work and, and move them out of the packages so the packages get simpler and the packages themselves don't have to care about it, but one central instance does all the work centrally. The next big thing that's going to be in the next release is automatic build dependencies. Uh, that comes from the Rust and Go folks. The problem here is that um, when many of those new languages do have their own package format and they do have all those metadata already like dependencies on what other packages they depend and it's a pain to to synchronize that right now so there are tools that can read some other uh, rust or go package description and turn it into a spec file but it's not that's great as a starting point but it's not something that's very helpful on an for distribution that does updates because you don't want to overwrite your spec file. You want to keep that and want to keep your history and your patches and everything. You don't want to copy over stuff that gets generated elsewhere all the time. The automatic build dependencies will solve this to some uh, extent. It's basically a build script that is run after prep and will generate uh, uh, dependencies for the build. That's going to be interesting for the OBS people that probably still sit down there uh, not suspecting anything. <laughs> uh, as it breaks a lot of assumptions uh, of the build which we have. Right now the assumption is you can just build a an, 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 uh, source RPM without anything, basically with RPM only. And you can then start a build with the dependencies in there with and being guaranteed that it's going to succeed because if you have all the dependencies installed. That's going to break, but it's not as bad as I first thought, so you basically have to do another round, read in the new dependencies and restart the build. It's going to be okay, I promise, maybe. <laughs> um, so another thing that's, that's, that's kind of RPM-ish, but not really, um, that's probably more Fedora specific and we have to see how that uh, translate to other distributions is I want to get some stuff out of the uh, spec file and using the git repositories we have the spec files in as data store. I'll elaborate on that, it's a bit more complicated. And for the long term things what, what we want to do is um, having templates within the spec files that can be uh, maintained centrally. So you can have boiler, you can remove some of the boilerplate stuff and have it in a central location that does uh, things. There are basically two, two um, um, directions to these. One is, this, is something to have uh, templates for building. So you have for different uh, uh, languages uh, prepared build templates that you can use. That's still very vague in my mind. The question here is what can be centralized, how many um, configurations do you need, or is, um, and what can actually be saved um, in, a, in, in complexity, or if you, de if you need so many knobs that it's not worth doing. But we have, we'll look into this uh, in more detail. And another thing is uh, building sub-packages is currently kind of a pain. Um, the thing that's com currently most complicated is uh, debug info packages. 
and that's solved currently by some code somewhere in RPM that basically does them in C code, which is not that beautiful. But there are all of all, a lot of other um, use cases where right now those those uh, sub packages have to be done by hand. Um, but I will also go into details soon. So what we currently have, if you, if, if you do an update, you have to create a patch somehow, you have to add it to the spec file, you have to pick a patch number, find out which is the next suitable, then you have to apply that in prep using the number above, uh, you have to increase the release, you have to add a change log entry, you have to use the number, you, the release number you just increased from above, you have to add your name and email, then you have to commit this, I don't know what, what you do in SUSE, where do you store your spec files? Do you have? Integrated BCS in the build service. And okay, so you put them somewhere else, but if, so. We, we have a macro, so we don't need to remember the patch number. Yeah. That one line that doesn't matches. So everybody does. It's auto setup. Yeah. Yeah. Auto setup or auto Yeah. Yeah. So we can put it in, in Git, and typically you'd even have to put a change log, uh, have to copy the change log message, or you have something in Git also. So it's a lot of steps. Yeah, we already uh, removed uh, uh, this step here with uh, with, out, with uh, auto setup. The next release will uh, allow you to not set a number, so we will auto number the patches, which makes sense if you use auto setup because you, who, who cares what number the patch has. Um, this is more interesting for us because we have different branches for different releases, so we might want to cherry pick stuff from one branch to another, and this is a total nightmare because there's <laughs> nothing in here that doesn't give a conflict. Uh, <laughs> literally. <laughs> um, so, and, and I will try to look if we can get rid of the change log by basically generating that from the Git backlog, and probably also uh, calculate the release number from the Git by just counting up. So that will re uh, reduce the number of things that can go wrong or be wrong. It also will basically remove all those things that create a merge conflicts for us. Because you basically just put in the patch, the patch adds one line up here, and if it's a conflict that's not that bad, it's just a one line uh, somewhere in the right moment that might be in the wrong order, who cares? You, you put it in there and then you, the commit message stays the same and it just does everything else. That's something I want to look in for Fedora. That will probably take a while till it gets to the point where it's interesting for, for you guys. But this will probably be some kind of white paper how to do that or what, what can be done there. So I will probably have a look at that. Uh, moreover, <laughs> even with the external file, we're still copying the OBS VCS, so it's still in two places. So they have the same problem anyway. Yeah. Yes, but it's it's all, it's pre-given. So you commit, and you get the whole text already pasted into it. Yeah. Or you could commit without having to change this file and have those entries in there and pull it from there. Mm. Depends. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah but. Uh, history to the whole process. Yes. Will you make this work on more distance? Will you make this work on more distance? On? I will make this work on more distance. On? Well, the, the stuff that is in our, that we do within RPM will of course be upstream RPM. The other stuff, the problem is that it's all basically build system or, or uh, logic, so it depends on, on the integration in the build system or the way you store your spec file. So that's... Maybe talking about the whole patch thingy and the cut part recording. Yeah, that, that, the, the, the auto setup stuff is done already and the, uh, the patch number stuff is uh, going to be the next release. So that's more or less that's done. We we'll just have yeah, to release it. If you want to make it work that you can have it also for like your different branches, you need to backport it to 29, 28, 27. Yeah, we will see how... The, 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 thing, the, thing, the thing is, the thing is, you're probably. No, Igor will make it. So first, now I don't say anything about what we're doing well. 
but uh, we, we can talk about Fedora, and we've so far been hesitant backporting too many stuff back. We'll see. But that's, that's a topic for another, another rainy day. Um, that's basically what we're trying to do here. Um, then dynamic build dependency, I already said that. There will be a new section that will be run after prep. Um, the main thing is that it will require build system implement, uh, integration. You will be able to do that in, uh, also on the command line, of course. So you have to uh, expect that your build <laughs> might fail on missing build dependencies, even though you already installed all of them that you had in your, in your source up here. So that's, that's basically a main change uh, that is in there. The other thing is, as a packager, you can probably outsource ge generating the build dependencies f from your package. And it will be, that's one section less that can go wrong if the packages change. I assume there will be uh, tools for the typical uh, candidates like, uh, like Rust. Uh, Igor is working on that. He's, he's hiding, he's hiding in, the, in the background. Um, and brought the rest to, to open Suda as well. Yeah, so we, that's on your doorstep. <laughs> uh, and I hear the Go people are also interested in, in using this. The thing is, that's how it's going to, to start. I can imagine that on the long term, even classical uh, packages may be using this. I mean, it's not that great if you want to get the requirements out of a configure file, but uh, but CMake maybe um, maybe 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 one can even convince upstream to basically ship a machine readable file of dependencies at some point if we downstream are able to actually process that and, and make something useful with it. So so I I see there's more thing that is more impact that this can have in the long term, but it will probably take a while until it, all the tooling gets in place and, and um, it actually gets adopted. Um, so the another thing when we're looking on, on, on the packages, when I've been thinking about packages, is um, there is a weird um, conflict about who is actually controlling what in the RPM land. So there's, of course, things that are RPM upstream that we do, and then they are implemented and everyone else has to follow because if we change something, yeah, we changed it. Then there is, of course, a packager which has most control over the package itself. And there's a very weird in-between layer of the distribution um, um, that has very little control right now. And so it's very difficult to actually centralize stuff out of the packages and, and, and bring, bring that in, in a place where people think about a bigger picture. So we've tried to do that with uh, the file triggers to, to be able to get the scriptlets to a central place. But I think in the long term, we need to think about more, um, if there are more places where we can centralize things. And, um, um, currently, that's really difficult because there's no implementation level. So there's, I don't know, in, in OpenSUSE, but in Fedora, we have huge amounts of uh, packaging guidelines. Pages over pages over pages over pages. How things are to be done, how they to be named, how they be, should look like, what you can't and couldn't do, what you shouldn't do, what you might do if you ask someone or what else. Um, the, the, the worst thing about all those uh, guidelines is yeah, there's a package review, but if your package is in, no one cares. So um, there are all those rules that may or may not be followed, and there's no way to actually put them into the world as an entity on their own. And so I hope that there, there we can find ways to, for one, help the packager doing the right thing, and on the other hand, giving the distribution or parts of the distributions more control over a set of packages of their interest. I th first thought if we can do something on a 
distribution level, but I think that's not possible. The, pack the reason why there's so much control on the packager level is because the packages are so different. And that's one of the reasons why RPM is so hard and so complicated, because we have to cover basically every possible situation that might be somewhere. And there's no way to, to like fit them all into one solution. But there are a lot of packages that look a lot the same. All the Python packages, um, or, or the font packages, or, or the language packages. and So so there are a lot of packages that, that belong together, either by, by the way they are built, or they are, what they contain, or how they are relate to. And so I think we need to focus, if we can find um, solutions and that allow those packages to um, to be maintained in a more um, controlled way with a more centralized um, approach. Um, but that's going to be tricky because those structures don't really under, uh, exist because there's no point in me like having a script saying, well, that's, that's what Python packages should look like. You need basically a group within a distribution that actually takes care of this. This um, extends to RPM um, to some extent that we also have a lot of to a lot of the tools that we already have upstream is are things that we don't really maintain well because we don't know and we don't care really. So there are all kinds of those dependency generators for different languages and I'm fine, I know Python, I can look at a Python dependency generator and make some sense of it. Then there is a Go dependency generator, and I have no idea how that's even supposed to work, and there are all these other um, languages. And so there's the, we've tried the last year or two, but not succeeded much, basically push them out and basically hand them over as a separate project that are maintained by different people that actually care about how those uh, packages look like. So I invite everyone, if you're, if you're taking care of some of those groups of larger packages. Talk to us if you, have, if you want to get involved. Um, so we can basically hand those adjacent um, areas over to people that actually care because RPM upstream can't really get involved into all those um, ever growing number of, of, of package families that, that have special needs and need special care. And one of the things that we want to look into perform uh, feature-wise is how to make this easier and um, how to offer solutions uh, to those groups that it can be actually done. Yeah, you can write macros and RPM, and, but that's all kind of ugly right now. So it's, it's it probably is some th a lot of things can be done if you really want to, but you run into issues very quickly. So um, if you want to basically, if you want to ship those macros as separate files and, and, and automatically set dependencies on those stuff. So there's probably a lot of uh, f smaller feature that we will look into over the next year to see if, if we can make this easier. Um, and one of the goals is uh, to, to centralize those boilerplate code. That's not that interesting, but at least um, get this done. I've looked at eBuild, which does something very similar to this. Um, those uh, um, um, interest groups need to f we need to get in contact with. And the idea is, of course, to um, um, this will be, of, of course, optional. So we are not going to re remove the other stuff. So, But that means, on the other hand, Packages actually will need to be moved more or less by hand or by, by script uh, to those new options. One um, um, way this could solve is if you put those uh, scripts or templates into, into separate uh, versions in, for different releases, you could get rid of all those if, if lines that litter a lot of our uh, Packages and I hear that's even worse in OpenSUSE. Not not pointing fingers, but um, so. But but if you have centralized 
uh, scripts that are used there, you can have different versions for different releases that does do the right thing without the um, package even knowing the difference, hopefully. Um, the other thing is uh, dealing with sub-packages. That's currently uh, um, the problem with this, with sub-packages in RPM right now is the overall attitude that RPM has in spec files. The spec file right now basically is a um, consistency check for the software it packages. So you have the file list, and the file list is there to type in every file so make sh to make sure that if there some file pops up that doesn't belong there, it gets an error. It creates an error, and you as a packager are supposed to look up what went wrong and fix that on, or fix the list or whatever. And the same thing is also true for sub-packages. So as soon as something goes wrong there, you will get an error and the package will not build. Um, and I think we might be able to basically just loosen those rules or be able to loosen those rules basically on, on, on a, by a switch to be able to have um, um, template packages that will build if everything is right. So, so you can basically have a an, an devil template that will be used and it will uh, swallow all those files that look uh, the right way, so all the, the include files, we will just move there if there are some. And the behavior will be if there are no files to be included because it's not an C package but some documentation package, those package will just not be built without generating an error. So you have those uh, templates you can use and, and it will f uh, um, fail graciously and not um, bother you. I have some ideas how to do that, but it's um, still um, brewing in my mind how to do this in detail. The, in the end, it's a question of, of philosophy, how much convenience you want for the packager and how much control you want uh, to uh, bind down how the package actually should work. Um, there is the... Um, um, possibility, of course, to use the build templates from above to actually include those uh, templates. So you could have, um, so that even those um, sub-packages get basically generated automatically. And you could have like a distribution level includes that would determine w what level of sub-packages are actually built for those packages that are using this. So you could say, well, we want all the uh, lib all the non-binary uh, files split out in a separate package. So we would only have the, the binary stuff in the lib package and everything else gets a lib, no source RPL, RPM or something like this. Or you would be able to split out all language files and basically explode every, every application into like 50 language sub-packages. And you could switch this on and off basically without even touching the package. So that's basically, yeah, well, one interesting thing is how to, what to do with files. And there is a couple of uh, mechanisms that we would need there, like some sub-package stealing files from another. And or if, so the, the problem is right now, files are more or less um, taken care of very carefully. But if you want to enable switch on and sub-package, you of course have to move the files over there without generating an error in the other package that may list them still. So there's a couple of, uh, there's, so we will need some syntax that, that will allow to do that without generating errors. And we will also need something to basically append packages. That's something that's currently not possible. So you cannot have like a second file list for f to add files to a package that may be coming from a template. So if you have a devil package, you might have those other files you want in there too, so you will add something like this. So that's the things we're th I'm thinking at night. I'm thinking about at night. Questions, comments, scared faces. Um, I, I do have I do have RPM merch for the best comments. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, my main gripe has always been the introduce new macros or new features in summary. 
for us it's very easy to have backport packages. And uh, I really hate that you then have to do if conditionals in the spec file too. So that's why I was asking if you can make it that we can easily backport those features. So backporting, like rebuilding RPMs on newer older distros still works fine. Um, yes, uh, the question was about uh, backporting and uh, how to make it easier to make those new features and new macros to actually uh, work on all the releases that are built from the same spec file and to avoid all the if, if uh, release version something. So in Fedora avoids this to some degree by having actually different um, uh, Git branches, so they're not, they not building from the same file. Um, but uh, they're not everyone is willing to split up the spec file into actually different versions, so we basically get the same thing. Backporting features is kind of difficult. There's basically, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's no magic here. There are two ways to do that. Either you update RPM in the old version, that's something a lot of people feel very uncomfortable with. And the other thing is basically backporting the single patches, which is something we have done, but we are trying to avoid in, because it's of course a lot of work and may break stuff anyway. But there's no real solution for this. The real solution is not to have too many different versions. <laughs> Or the other, the other thing what we've actually done in, um, in the past is delay the usage of those features for a release or two. So you, so you basically drain, drain out the old, uh, the old RPM versions that can't support it and only use it later on. So they've been we, waiting 15 years. Yeah, they've been waiting 15 years. <laughs> The, the thing, the thing is, we've we've yeah. we've we've done that in the past, yeah. but but not not for this reason. Thank God we have successfully broken that because that made life really really hard. Yeah, um, um, we we are, we can't no longer do that. So we are trying to keep up and be faster, and that's a good thing. But it it balances out. So being slow sometimes has benefits. Being fast sometimes has benefits faster. <laughs> At least from the macros perspective, one of the things that we did for Fedora was if they were just macros that run in the macro engine, we just yoinked them and put them into another package and then just forced them into the build room for all the older releases. So that works for us for like 90% of feature backboards. When it comes to like they change the way RPM build works, you're kind of screwed. Yeah. So that's why like I was wondering, you said, oh yeah, then you don't have numbers anymore in the patch lines and they don't cause conflict anymore, but... Um, yeah, but that's something that can be done in, on outside yeah. of RPM, so you don't actually... Yeah, yeah the, the missing numbers, not really. Um, but you have a pre preprocess that adds another yeah, yeah. yeah, that would be a possibility, yes. Uh, a comment for me, this looks a lot of magic, which scares me. Yeah. Because for me, this yeah. <laughs> Why are you scared of this? Yeah, for me, explicit is better than implicit. So, for example, my question is, you have generated build requests. Bring it offline, like they have tools like SIP and SPAC, which figures out build requests for you. So what value does it bring to do with a macro and not bring it beforehand, before commenting? I mean, once you see a macro, the other I see the build request for me as a reviewer, I read thousands of spec files, it's easy to see the difference, for example. You might introduce a new build request and I might not know it. Um, well, the, the, the main reason, so the question was, this looks like a lot of magic and um, why not uh, generate the build requires previously in another step? And one of the reasons is that we first you need this, you need the infrastructure to do the other, another step. The second thing is um, those new languages basically, yeah, you could do it previously, but it's kind of part of the build process actually. So so they they came they come prepackaged with the information in in inside, and basically using this during the build process makes it. Ease, uh, makes it harder for, for this to actually go wrong or break. 
So it's basically, uh, you could do it outside, but you, you need to you need to have all the stuff wrapped around. If you do it in the package, you can actually have the process of extracting those dependencies as part of the package. Yeah, RPM is RPM is all a tooling problem. No, I mean, we, have, <laughs> we have stuff that runs before you comment, which basically can be wrapped to generate user interface. But then I see the explicit user interface, so not technically stops it from making it so that I part of an OBS review that the generated build required stuff no source is actually captured, recorded, and put into the reviewer field. So we we are not ha we are not hiding them. So the so the. Uh, but I agree, on the other hand, uh, scripted thingy, that every spec file calling LD config is just stupid. You, you can just figure out, it's a library, I have to call it, which would simplify spec files so that I have a stuff patch, etc. I agree. It would simplify so this is a comment to yeah. the to that. Yeah. More follow-up question. How do you do it in Koji? Like, we set up a new build environment for every build. So yes. we need to know up front. Uh, what we need to install into that. How do you do it in Koji? Do you want to then run the Rust extract tool on your Koji resolving thingy that creates a build job that then... Um... So Koji does it by, you. we take from this git, we create a source package. Source package gets passed to mock. Mock runs DNF build depth, which extracts those, installs those build depths, then runs RPM build against that. RPM build bombs out with another source package, which then runs DNF build dep against that, creates a new chroot that runs the build a second time, and then runs through that, and then that's the final build. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> except for the fact that there's only one that's so socket package. Well, at the end of the build, there'll be a final source package, but there's an intermediary no source package that's created as part of this thing. So the, th the thing is, it's actually. So, is, the, the way it's implemented in RPM, it's actually meant to, to restart the build. And it, you can actually restart the build even from the extracted uh, prep, uh, from the uh, uh, extracted sources, if you want to. So the, the turnaround in there is very small if you, if you do it properly. So it yeah. basically just creates a header with the dependencies in it, and you basically install those into the existing build route and then restart the build. That's all you need to do. Hmm? You need a local, uh, well, you need to. Uh, he copies the RPMs in, then starts the VM, and the VM only gets the RPMs that it has pre resolved. So there's no external interaction. Yeah. None. There, there's no secondary resolution process at all. Yeah, that will be interesting. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, so, 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 so I've, been to I've been talking to Michael Schroeder, and he so said. We know the dependency I know. before. Yeah. I know. That's what. That's this all one of build service. I know. It's going to be yeah, fun to watch. We will see that. I've been talking to Michael Schroeder, and he said he thinks he can do it somehow. But <laughs> Michael's also a god. Yeah, so, so, so who, who am I to question him? I'm not, I'm not repeating that. <laughs> Sometimes I need to make a package for them so that the package can be deployed on their system. So can you describe the proper way how to package a Java simple application? What, 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 what is the case? Uh, uh, there's no such thing as simple Java. <laughs> there's, a simple, there's, a, there's a very simple answer, and the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> I need to specify what kind of virtual machine yeah, we have people that do Java packaging. Uh, that they are not me. Is, is there any in the documentation for the Red Hat Enterprise? Docs at FedoraProject.org. There is a packaging guidelines page. The Java stuff applies to all Red Hat family distributions. Uh, okay. Yeah, as we say, we have a lot of packaging guidelines. Yeah. The, 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 prob the problem is probably not that there are too little guidelines. The problem is rather than there are too many. They mostly apply to season two. I was just going to say, I was talking to my manager, he said we are now using 
file trees in all sorts of places. And That's not for libraries. And yeah. because we maintain much of the base system, that means everyone else can see the open system images. Okay. Thank you. We are not there yet. Oh, they won't take for years of arguing with your GPC people. What does it have us? So, any other questions? A bit out of the box. Uh, I don't remember the name of the guys, but years back there was this group of former RBM developers that, that built a package manager that used Python inheritance. So you could have base package Python extended by a big oh, people. Corner, right? Exactly. Uh, that was the, the package manager. I like that concept because basically you only have to describe the changes between boilerplate and what you kind of think is doing. I know RPM is miles away from that, but I like the thinking. And maybe one could do some really hacky things like, I don't know, using Ginger and then that spec file or to, to simulate some of that. You are getting very close to some of the things that other people have been doing right now. So uh, I've not yet looked at Connery, but uh, that's clearly something I will look into. Can someone? I'm Yeah, so can, can someone, I'm kind of, I'm kind of chained here. Okay, any other questions, remarks? A very, very stupid one. Why does RPM insist on expanding commented out macros? That's, that's, a, that's, a, good, that's a good question, and it's, that's, that's easy to answer because there are no comments in RPM. Oh, God. That's not a good answer. Yeah, no, that's, but that's the actual answer. The thing is, if, if you have a hash, that's a an, that's an comment within, an, an, uh, within a shell that's part of the shell thing. And RPM is completely oblivious of the fact that you thought you would commenting or something out. That's something we actually looked into like a half a year ago. And I, I don't know if we some, did something about it, but it's... It's something. I I think I think we added a warning for that. I'm uh, not one. I think I added an error to get or, master, so that if it's a multi-line macro that is on a comment line, it will blow up instead of letting you build. Yeah, forward. something like this. <laughs> but that's a git master, which means it'll be coming up sometime in the far future. For you. No, <laughs> we're doing we're doing an alpha release next week. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, you're gonna actually do a release? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a plan. Oh, I just get my sister if you put that patch in. Yeah, that too. <laughs> but then so when do we get it like parts of that? I have some fun packages which involve because of macro resolution and. Uh, so, so, the, so the plan is to do an alpha release next week and uh, refine that through the next Fedora release cycle, which ends in October or something, November, I think. October. Yeah, the Penny just sent out the the change proposal yeah. for RPM four fifteen. So you're feel free to grab the alpha release as soon as it's out. I oh God. you, you may, maybe good. maybe wait a week or two before you push it. <laughs> yeah, but but of course, yeah, feel free play around with it. Um, I mean, yeah, we will. Typically, Fedora takes most of the heat of uh, getting the really fresh stuff, but there's n really no reason why other people shouldn't try and feel a bit of the pain. Yeah, but 75 <laughs> patches on RPM makes it very hard to test new versions. Yeah, but, but even, even, even if you don't put in a dis distribution right away, you can play around with it. Uh, uh, like I have a quick of macro resolution, and if you have more variables, then it's getting funded, get funds in the stack hour. Can you just open a ticket for with some test case? Because the, the macro engine, we have Pavlina, which has looked into the macro engine. I, for years, have basically refused to even look at it because it's scary on the outside and maybe it's scary on the inside. <laughs> How would I know? <laughs> but 
So, yeah, there's probably still stuff that can be fixed, even if it's code that's 20 years old. When can we get Elon? I... I will probably just... I will, I will probably just merge it as soon as I get back from the conference. Thank God. <laughs> it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's, an, it's an epic over like years and, and yeah. don't get pissed on it. Okay, any other questions? I think we're done here. Thank you.